Hello everyone, this is Ray Williams and uh, we are at our, uh, the penultimate event of the evening where we uh, are going to talk to the great recording engineer, the owner of not one, not two, not ten, 17 Grammy Awards, a man who has recorded on many continents, a, a man who I count among my friends, a guy I've known for a long time, a great guy, a great friend of Imsta, a great friend of the industry. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about Rafa Sadina, who's here with us. Uh, Rafa, man, how are you? So good to see you. Great. So great to see you, too. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's great to have you. And you're in your studio. Um, this is your home studio, right? As, yeah. as we call it, home studio. Exactly. This is what I call my home studio. <laughs> oh, my God. How much gear is in this studio? And what's your electricity bill, bro? Electricity bill is actually pretty, pretty steep. I have <laughs> a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, but you know, but I love it. So I pay it, you know, happily pay it every month. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so Rafa, man, you know, we've done an interview with you. Uh, we, we, we put out the, uh, we premiered the short form of it, which was 30 minutes, but you know, we went for you know, over two hours. Uh, we're going to put the long form out later. We're going to actually score it. We had the guy who's scoring it on a little bit before. Um, and you've taken an amazing journey, man, from, from Spain, from the Basque country, all the way to Los Angeles. And you've, you've made it as a recording engineer uh, at the highest level. And I just want to say, you know, please don't take the, that, think that we take this for granted, that you would carve out some of the best time of the week, which is Saturday evening, <laughs> come here and talk to us. I know you got so many other things you could be doing, but I really appreciate the fact that you would do this. We should be uh, heading to a club right now. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so, so you're doing this. I promise I won't keep you more than two and a half hours like we did the last time. Fine. <laughs> uh, um, but anyway, um, how is it going right now for you, man? How, how, how are things? These are good. These are actually, I will say more than good. They are great. Um, um, it's about, you know, doing the kind of stuff that you love to do. It's not just about doing or working on projects. It's about working on the kind of projects that you really choose to work on. The things that are really become like your babies, you know, the, you know, so that's why I'm working on so many projects that are, some of them are like very well known, advertised, you know, promoted and others are simply not. They're like very indie type of projects that I truly cherished you know uh, like the kind of you know when i work on flamenco music when i work with uh, some folk artist or i work on some jazz music you know you we know it's not the kind of projects that you know make it into the charts into the big mm -hmm. charts but mm -hmm. they're like you know they're like blood to me <laughs> you know they, yeah, I, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really cherish i really need you know that kind of energy in my life and be because there is a there is a um uh, uh an authenticity there's a purity uh there's there's the love of the music that is imbued in all these artists they're doing it because they love it because they have to do yeah. it and the fact that because you're they there have they yeah. have to do it they have to propel the culture and they the fact that you, they're giving you that responsibility to capture that that's a big responsibility on you yeah absolutely and i i don't take it for granted you know i think it's an even bigger responsibility than when they call me to do like a big, you know, big act, which is, a, it has a huge commercial value, but uh, it's more about, let's, let's say, you know, it's more about the numbers, about that, mm -hmm. you know, presence in the charts and whatnot. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's obvious, obviously, it is a business. We mm -hmm. have to understand, always understand that it is a business. But within that allocation of the kind of projects I do within the business, side of things i also need to do other other projects that are not business related you know that are right. just simply I, I will always say you know very often i will say they are basically the truth about mm. many things they are the truth about uh, many other styles of music you know uh, i work on everything i work on blues i work on jazz i work on because I love it, not because I'm going to chart or because they pay better than, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. the, the right. chart, you know, type of projects. But right. yeah, 
I think it's important to understand and embrace that, you know, in your career. Yeah, and I think um, also the fact that 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 you kind of uh, 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 straddle two huge languages, you know, Spanish and English, that has given you a kind of a versatility uh, that you know a unilingual English person won't have. The fact that you grew up in uh, in in Europe, uh, exposed to a lot of different music, the proximity you have to to Latin America and that music. Um, that has been a big plus for you in terms of your yeah. versatility and your, your utility to the industry. Yeah, it has become a big plus a, a little bit after the fact, because at the very beginning, I didn't quite understand it as an asset because mm-hmm. I was trying to, I was actually trying to fit in the, in the U.S. market. I was trying to fit because this was really my, even though I started my career in Europe, it, this was my re, my real biggest start. You know, when I mm-hmm. came to LA, when mm-hmm. I arrived in LA and I started working at Ocean Way, recording studios, and and I started working with big acts. You know, I was exposed to that. This was my new beginning, let's call it. And but I was always trying to fit, and I didn't understand that I didn't truly need needed to fit, but I needed to propel in. Mm-hmm many other directions which i did later on in my career other people understood it before i did though mm-hmm. other producers other people that will hire me mm-hmm. understood that asset but i wasn't truly in control of it at the very beginning it took me quite some time to i had it in me but it took me some time to understand it embrace it and use it mm-hmm. and and to all those the other people that are out there um that have an eclectic characteristic, uh, be it they're from another country or be it from their, another part of the country even, or they love a certain style of music. Um, what do you say to them as far as career building and how to survive in the, in the business? I mean, with this eclectic uh, sort of component to their, their persona or their, or, their, or their being, what do you say to them? I mean, should they embrace it? Uh, obviously, I think that they should embrace it. They should embrace it. Anything... Anything that makes you distinct in any kind of way is an asset. It truly is an asset. Because at the end of the day, what we do is dealing with emotions, feelings. And the more you know about how to tackle emotions, emotion, you know, feelings, you know, the more you understand people, the more you understand, you know, different characters, the more you understand why people do what they do, why they create specific types of music, what, where, where the sensibility is, the more empowered you are to, to do your job as a producer, as an arranger, as an engineer, all of them in every single one of these aspects. Um, you, you are actually looking beyond, you know, what's the first, you know, what the first reaction is or what the first encounter my look like i mean you are looking much deeper into into the project you're looking into you know people's desires people's you know ambitions you 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 can spot them more easily so i always say you know anything that makes you a little bit more eclectic the more you are going to be able to understand a bigger array of emotions and people's reactions and it's going to be an asset for you uh, People say like, no, that's the producer's job, you know, to to truly, you know, deal with the artist. No, not at all. It's everybody's job. It's even the assistant's job Mm -hmm. to truly understand uh, the artist and help you, you know, uh, deal with situations and deal with specific moments during a production to make everybody feel at ease or even help you as a producer, um, create a little bit of tension in the studio, but in an intelligent kind of way, not Mm -hmm. in an out of control kind of way, not being a disruptor, uh, Mm -hmm. a complete disruptor of of a situation, but being, you know, being a co-creator with the artist you are working with. You have to create those kind of situations. And it's not always, um, I always say, you know, I always say it, sometimes it needs to be a little bit ugly in order to be good, in order for things to be like really great. 
Mm-hmm. It, you know, you, things have to be a little bit ugly in the studio once in a while. Uh, mm-hmm. It's part of the journey. Uh, but in order to do it, you have to do it in an intelligent kind of way. Mm-hmm. You have to be in control of how you do it and how everybody else in the studio helps you do it. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually going through one of those situations right now with, with an artist I'm working with. And it's all about, you know, tension and release. It's like music. When we're creating music, we're always dealing with those kind of elements, you know, tension, release, how uh, you make an emotion appear to be bigger than it is by creating a release moment right before the big moment hits, right? Mm -hmm. Dealing with people is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. It's like writing a song. It's very, very similar to writing a song, you know, with somebody. There are some of the same kind of elements you deal with. In order to make the hook really, really huge, maybe the last two bars of the of the pre-chorus need to be like pretty chill or mellow, or you need mm-hmm. to create some kind of break. Same thing with people. So yeah, I say I always use the same kind of analogies, but it is very, very true for me. So for you, you see the 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 recording engineer sort of sort of sort of profession as being part of the creative process not just somebody that's coming in work for hire and then leaving uh and it's a technical part of it it's 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 a it's a technical part but it's a, it's also part of the creative sort of production the, the, the production of the creativity the contributor to the creativity you see the engineering as part of that a fundamental part of it i absolutely i always saw it as a fundamental part a fundamental part of it and i think that was a little bit of it had to do a little bit with my success when i was just engineering i wasn't producing i was mm-hmm. simply engineering mm-hmm. i won't say simply i was engineering right. it's not a simple thing to do yeah. but part of my success i was that i think it was understanding some of this some of these some of these things that i'm talking about um otherwise you are just making beautiful sounds mm-hmm. You know, you are not uh, helping the artist with, you are not further helping through the process. Mm -hmm. You are only helping with an outcome, but you are not helping with what's next. Mm -hmm. You know, and when we're dealing with a song, very often um, a song has many faces during production. Mm -hmm. And during those phases, you are also responsible for creating new opportunities as an engineer. Mm-hmm. And you can only do that by being a little bit using some of this psychology, mm-hmm. by understanding what other people are going through, what the producer must be going through, what his um, tribulations are about the song, you know, what he's not quite getting, getting right now and how you can help him, you know, him or her, you know, achieve next you know so you're basically yeah you're a contributor you you should be a co-creator with them you should consider yourself a co-creator i never saw my my post as an engineer as just as you know as the watcher of good sound you know or you know making it sound better obviously that's part of the task but it's not just about that sometimes you have to understand why you need to make it sound worse in order to fit the bill, in order to make the song happen. Mm-hmm. And I've gone through so many phases throughout my career because I work on so many different styles of music. And some of the styles of music actually were a contradiction, contradiction of the other style of music uh, I was working on. Right. For example, I was working, you know, when I work with Dread, you know, working, doing a lot of rap, hip hop, or I was working with some Latin music world was that was like very, very mellow and very romantic and or jazz or whatever it might be. Sometimes the styles truly were like absolute opposites, mm-hmm. absolute opposites. But understanding the message that you wanted to convey through the music and the emotions that you needed to create, even as a sound engineer, were so important to me. So the first time somebody tells you, no, that sounds too good, is the time you realize, okay, my, my job as a sound engineer, as a recording engineer or mix engineer, is not just to make it sound beautiful. It's to make it sound right. 
which is mm. very, very different. Different, different. It has different. to sound right for the kind of emotion you are trying to convey. Wow. That very moment. So now, Rafa, I got to say, um, I know you for a long time. And the level of passion you have for music, man, it seems to be going up. <laughs> um, how much of that is is part of your success? Like just your it's not, it's beyond the love. It's a, it's you you are almost a one with music. How important is it for people coming into the industry to really check themselves and and to see, hey, do I have this passion or not? I think it has to do with connection. You have to always check that you connect it regularly. You have to make sure that you are connecting with music. You are connecting with... Um, I think that the day I don't connect with music, the day that I don't feel it in my skin, like I'm listening to something and I don't care, is the day I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to say like, okay, I'm out of here. I'm done. Right. This is not right. for me. Right. But you really need to connect at that level. You really need to wake up every day. And sometimes it's hard because you go to the studio and you're not in the mood. You are like, oh, shit, you know, like today I'm, not, I'm truly not in the mood. Something happened or you're tired or whatever. It doesn't matter. But you get in the studio, you play that song, you start working on it. Ten minutes go by. And next thing you know, you're like, you're like jumping. You're like super energized. You need to feel that every single day you need to feel that every fucking day <laughs> okay right. that's that's very much pretty much the key but there's no way to force it you either feel it or you don't but in a way you have to meditate a little bit about why you are doing this mm -hmm. and and how you are doing it not just why you are doing it but how you are doing it what was your strategy to the future as an engineer or producer what do you what do you picture yourself doing in a year in two years in five years what kind of, what kind of career you want to have you have to project that a little bit mm -hmm. and i think it, it is very very important you cannot just let things happen by letting things happen you you might end up being like super successful just doing one little aspect of what you are capable of and not being happy about it. Mm -hmm. Just feeling that you are in a repetitive kind of pattern mm -hmm. with your career and with your daily life and what you do. For example, right now I'm producing, you know, a flamenco opera project. And then I'm at the same time working on something very, very alternative, very indie. And then I'm, I'm, I'm actually working on, a bunch of different operas, which was a new thing for me. It started like 10 years ago. And it is music and it's amazing music. It's amazing music. And I only think about that, about how amazing the songs I'm working on are. That's the only thing, thing I think about. I'm not thinking about, oh, oh shit, you know, here, here we go, like 10 songs of this. No, I'm thinking about, okay, which ones, you, you are not going to love every song you work on in your life, okay? But you can always contribute to make it better. Mm -hmm. You can always contribute to make it better. You can put a tiny bit of your soul into it and manage to find the key to make it better, even if you don't love it. And you are going to feel accomplished enough with those specific moments that are not your cup of tea. And then you are going to move on to the greatest stuff that you absolutely love. And I think it is very important to also understand that, that it's impossible for you as a human being to love every single song. But you have to connect with every single song, even if you don't love it. You have to put a little bit of your soul, as I said, and be able to contribute and make it better. Whatever it means, better sometimes has to do with different aspects of what we do. All right, it has to do with the production, the arrangement, the sonics of it, but it could not, be, maybe it's not the sonics. Maybe as an engineer, your task is to find out what's not worth it in the arrangement and not emphasize it look for the opportunities in other places. 
So that's what I'm always thinking when I get a project, especially when I'm not producing, when it's a project where I'm just, um, where I'm just doing a, a little part of it, or I'm just mixing the song. I'm being command, you know, I'm just being given the song just to mix it. And obviously it's not my production. I didn't actually do it, but it's my responsibility to make it better, mm. to make it the best it can be from my point of view, obviously, but to make it the best. And in order to do that, you have to delete every preconception of everything and go like, okay, what is this song about? <laughs> Right. That's the right. kick need to be like 50 dB louder <laughs> right. or less or needs to be right. killed. Right. Uh, and that's where you have to connect with the son and with the situation. Now, let's let's talk about some of your methods of making things sound better. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you you talked about that. Now, if you're mixing uh, an opera and then next week you're mixing an alternative band and a week after that, you're doing a jazz thing. Um, and the next week after that, you might be doing a, a, a rock thing. W I mean, how do you approach, because these are very different uh, styles, yeah, totally. right? Different instruments, different number of instruments. How, what kind of method do you bring that say it's common to all of those different tasks? I think that the method, the, the first thing that I do and a lot of people unfortunately don't do is listen. Perfect. Not get to, you know, very often I go to a, to a mix session and I've been through this process over the, I don't know, many years of doing this. And I've seen other people do it. And I've seen my assistants try to do it or do it. And I've seen other engineers do it. Um, the first thing that people do is just do it and very often what you must not do is do it what you must do is listen just listen uh, listen to what you got listen to uh, maybe take a few notes you know open all of the tracks take a few notes see what the song is all about and try to figure out what's the strength of the song where is the strength sometimes the strength is in the lyrics or most often actually the strength is in the lyrics is mm -hmm. not to ever be <laughs> you know, ignore. And some people ignore the lyrics, ignore what the song is all about. And, and I actually had this conversation with another very well-known engineer not that long ago, like maybe 10, 15 years ago, and we did a, a thing together. And, and he was, and he actually, uh, actually told me that he very often doesn't listen to the lyrics that much. He he actually just gets to do it and gets excited by the track. I do excited, but I do get excited by the track, and you should get excited by the track. But the track are only there to serve ultimately the message, and the messenger is, is usually the singer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's the guy who is actually conveying that information to do with the help of other elements, right? Through so you can convey that information and that energy or that mood through the instrumentation and you do but the lyrics are the ultimate messenger mm -hmm. are the ultimate ultimate conveyor of information so you have to pay attention to the lyrics to pay attention to the expression pay attention to all of those details and then go like okay what what have i really got here mm -hmm. how hard or easy is it going to be for me to make this you know convey that message mm -hmm. um Sometimes it's super easy. You got a super talented um, communicator and other times you don't mm -hmm. and you have to fake it. You have to fake that sort of transmission of energy and information. You have to fake it with what we do as engineers, you know, with uh, all of our tricks and knowledge, you know, with compression and with this and that. Try to fake, you know, that there is such emotion or that delivery in the vocals and through automation, you know, automating every single syllable. So it seems like that person is actually projecting those words in a different kind of way from what you really got, right? Yeah. So, uh, for example, those talking about that, automation, that's the one thing that many people are 
a little bit mesmerized about because they don't understand it. What, what can I truly accomplish? Okay, I get these two lines of the guitar louders because they were like recorded lower in level. It's not about that. It's about creating that, you know, line of communication throughout the whole song, making sure that every element is actually communicating the way it should. And specifically with vocals, it is super, super basic and important with vocals mm -hmm. to create that, to be able to create that. Do you know, early on, do you know, I understood that as a listener, just as a music lover, when I listen to specific albums, I all go like, damn, just one word of the whole song will kill me, will do it for me. One word mm -hmm. of a whole song, of a, of a four minute long song, one word in the song will kill me. And I will play back over and over again. I'll play back like 50 times and go like, damn, the way it was, you know, express, express. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was the, the artist who expressed that directly, or maybe not. Sometimes it's, it, it is engineering and it is production. So mm -hmm. is that make believe that we need to, to understand Right, it's not just for the sake of making, creating glitter and lots of glitter. I mean, the glitter needs to happen in the right moment. <laughs> right, right. Not so, you cannot just sparkle it all over. It has to. Right, right. You need to know when it, it needs to happen. So, so, so listening is that is the is the key. Now, when it comes to you know um, recording, okay. Um, you know, do you have a, an approach? What, 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 do you, what do you say about the whole record, recording process? Do you enjoy it? Oh, I love recording. I, love, I think that recording is the, um, is the earliest expression of production in a project. It really is. It's when you are actually creating the, you are actually make you know, putting those first, you know, brushes, you know, on, on the paint and, and you're actually creating the, the cam, you know, the 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 base of the, the base. Yeah. yeah, you are creating, you know, you are creating the appropriate environment for things to flourish. For example, and it's as basic as going to the right recording studio, to the right, uh, and not just for the acoustics, for everything else, for for the mood, for the acoustics, for the space needed, for the musicians, you know, for. Uh, everything counts, you know, having the right selection of microphones and you have to imagine how you want it to sound at the end. You need to have that kind of imagination. You have to start like, oh, I imagine it could be like this. And you sometimes you achieve it uh, more easily than others, but you need to start somewhere. At least you need to have your own image of how is, is it going to be at the end. And then throughout the process, you you try to nail it, right? You try to narrow it down to, to what it needs to be. And sometimes during that journey, when you're starting to record, you have to change direction and you have to adjust to what you are being given. Mm -hmm. Maybe the musicians are not expressing it the way you imagine it and is not giving you the kind of results that you imagine it will give you. So you are constantly adjusting. From minute one, the moment that somebody hits a snare or, or, the, or the singer gets to the vocal microphone, or from that very moment, you are adjusting. You are thinking, oh, shit. You know, like, this is what I imagine. This is what I did to accomplish that. This, is, this was my selection of spaces, microphones, distances to the microphones, all of this, but now this is the new reality. This is how they're actually uh, portraying themselves. And then you react to that and you move the microphones and you do something else and you compress something else differently to inspire, even to inspire the artist, to inspire the musicians, which is another element that we need to do as recording engineers. You have to understand that musicians are going to react to your monitor mix. Mm -hmm. They are gonna be reactive to your headphone mix, to the headphone mix that you create because they are being forced to play in a fake environment. 
they are not on a stage or in the in the rehearsal space playing in their own on their own terms mm -hmm. they're basically playing on your terms because you are providing the technological aspect of how things are going to go down right so you are they're being forced to play on headphones they're being forced to play this far from each other or this close from each other everything counts for example a bass player who is always used to playing right next to the drummer when you put put that bass player in an iso booth wow it, it could actually break things completely it could it depends on how season the the musician is but it could actually break things and you might be forced to take that musician back into the main room even if there is a compromise sound wise you might be forced to that because that musician needs to feel the energy and he needs that musician needs to feel feel the kick and needs to feel those hits right like right next you feel it in your skin you feel it in your guts i mean you don't just feel it through your ears so you have to think about all of these elements and you have to change your strategy continuously that's why when i'm working with a new artist i never work with and i'm strategizing how the recording session is going to go i always leave options open and ready to go for example i might have the bass player in an iso booth but i might have another di line or another you know line to go to the to the bass amp ready to go right next to the drums just in case i need that or maybe it's just a matter of communication you know being so far away doesn't help them communicate and work on the song because maybe you are in the studio and they are still writing parts of the song and by pulling them apart you are actually breaking the communication and it doesn't quite work i also learned a lot of this with don was don was when I started working with Don early on, I was only in my early 20s. Uh, we will do so many live sessions, right? With everybody on the floor. Basically, that was a great school, you know, working at Austin Way. We did so many, not just orchestral or big band, uh, big band sessions, but we did a lot of, you know, regular sessions with regular rock bands or blues bands. It didn't matter. All kinds of bands. And you learn quickly about that. You learn about, you learn to also ask the right questions right before the session. Mm -hmm. Are you, how do you usually rehearse <laughs> in your place? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you wear, do any of you guys wear headphones? Why? You know, sometimes they were, they, somebody wears headphones so they don't hear the other guy so much, you know, some of those, you know, mm -hmm. super close headphones or uh, you need to learn, you know, who is who, how, how they work together and how they work on their own. What they even, even the elements that they don't like about working together with the band. Sometimes you find those too, right? Uh, they, they might work that way, but they hate it. So you have to recognize that you have to learn those you know that information you have to know about it and and then don't make the same kind of mistakes that they already make right. in the rehearsal place so so now after this after the material is recorded and you have it um and now you have to mix it uh you know we use eq we use reverb, we use compression, we use all these tools. Um, give us a sort of a, a, a 10,000 feet view of your approach. Again, using those, so, those same four different, desperate, different uh, uh, types of music and styles that you'll be presented. Let's look at the first one, equalization. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's, how, how do you look at EQ? I look it differently depending on the kind of project I'm doing. For example, if we're talking about classical music or we're talking about an opera, uh, usually you accomplish 90, 98% of what needs to be accomplished through the recording process. You don't actually wait for the mix to, um, 
change things. Let's call it change, not even enhance, but change mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. But when you are working on pop music, you are always open to changing things. And I'm talking like really changing things, dramatically changing things. Mm-hmm. I might have recorded something in the studio, but then I might come up with a new cool idea about giving an extra 12 dB of low end to the kick or to a different element because it creates an atmosphere or it creates you know, a momentum for the song. Mm-hmm. That's what really happens for me in mixing. Even when I have produced an album, it is very hard actually for me as a producer, those first couple of days mixing my own production is usually pretty hard because I have already done in a way the job during the production. So in order to be more imaginative during the mix process or even open my own mind to new opportunities, sometimes it is harder because, you know, things are a little bit more set in stone, right? Mm -hmm. So I need to be more adventurous in those situations. But if I was given a production and it's not mine and I need to mix it, it, yeah, I, I take no prisoners, you know, with things like EQ or compression or whatnot. But one of the keys more than anything else is levels. Levels are key to everything. And I learned this early on too, also with, you know, with great, great, great engineers, mixers, and, you know, with Glyn Jones or with George Massenburg or Al Smith or Ed Cherney, you know, just knowing where things need to sit, you know, musically speaking, where they actually belong. In a way, it's sort of an equalizer. You know, very often we look for space and we don't need to look for space by equalizing things, but we need to look for space by moving things around, by moving it to a different, you know. Different part of the spectrum, even. The different part of the spectrum. Moving yeah. Depth, depth. yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh-huh. absolutely. Uh-huh. So, 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 so that's a holistic kind of approach. Now, levels. You had mentioned levels and levels are, you know, that's that's an important thing. But there's there's input level, like recording level, mm-hmm. uh, there's output level. What do you do when the input level, recording level, not so good, not so high? It could have been better. You know, uh, very often you are not looking actually for the right level. You are actually looking for some kind of some kind of mood, something that creates some kind of mood. Um, you are looking for something that actually has sounds beefy or sounds light or sounds open. And that's super, super important during the input stage. I was saying that levels are very important to the mood because with levels, you know, by getting more uh, input gain stage, like with a guitar amp, same yeah. kind of concept, you know, yeah. you know, preamp stage or output stage is two different kinds of harmonic distortion, the two different kinds of, you create different textures. Mm-hmm. And I do that a lot uh, during recording. I try to achieve that during recording. Do you want something that sounds beefy or are you looking for something that sounds light and airy? Uh, You have to determine that even during the recording process. And if you haven't achieved it during the recording process, you can still manipulate some of that during the mix process. You can actually go in the mixing stage, you can go through a plugin and, you know, get more input gain kind of like, beef up those har- harmonics and try to make make it sound more closer to what you imagine so i do that a lot even during mixing now uh, how 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 much how much commitment do you do in the recording process meaning you know you would put certain things in place certain sounds certain maybe even compression maybe how 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 much commitment do you do of the of the of the audio to certain processing at the input, or do you leave everything kind of raw and deal with everything on the mixing side? No, I, I do commit. I do commit. I like to commit early on. I like to commit on the spot. I like to commit. And if I'm if it's a big if, then I will just mold this mold the signal. If I'm using, for example, some kind of compression that's a little bit extreme, and I'll just mold the signal and go to two different channels simultaneously. Because sometimes 
that kind of compression you can only achieve during the capture of the sound. You are not gonna, it's not gonna sound the same later on. Right, right. You can actually get close, but sometimes you need to achieve it. And sometimes even for the sake of getting the production value you wanna get, you need to do it right then, mm -hmm. right then and there. So mm -hmm. sometimes when that happens, I'll just have the raw signal, you know, going to, to tape, going to Pro Tools, and then I'll mold that signal in the patch bay, go through a different kind of processing and record that one too. Mm -hmm. And I might choose later, you know, I might choose to go to the raw version of it if I went too far. Mm -hmm. But at least I know, okay, I have that option. But it doesn't happen that often. I Most of the time, 99% of the time, I commit and it is what it is. That's what, <laughs> that's right, what you right, get. Right, right, right. Okay, talk to me a, lo a little bit now about um, uh, compression. You know, compression is such an important thing. Uh, give me your sort of a top-down view of how you approach uh, 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 compression. To me, compression is not a controlling sounds. You know, um, it was invented for that reason, limiting and compression. You know, it was developed for that reason. But in reality, with the big with a, the big array of options we have these days for compression, compression is more about tone, texture, how a specific musical line bounces with the music, mm -hmm. because by modifying the attack and the release, you make it feel different in the song. You can make a guitar sound like really on point, like really snappy on time, or you might, you can make it sound late by having you know a uh, quicker attacks and compressing the attack of the and you make it sound like more like a bouncy kind of element in the mix same thing with vocals and even same thing with the overall mix if you apply compression to the overall mix and i learned this with mastering engineers you can actually modify the feel of the, change the feel of the song slightly by calculating how you use the attack and release of compression in the full mix. You can make it sound like really, or you can make it sound like more. I don't know how to explain, but you hear it, you feel it. Mm -hmm. And master engineers have used this for the longest time. They have been using it forever. Mm -hmm. They really have. But it's a very unique um, skill, right? It's a very specific, very unique, but with a specific elements of a mix with a guitar with a vocal you can do the same thing mm -hmm. and and very often we even when you are uh, utilizing some of these uh, tools incorrectly somebody can actually call you off and say like oh shit you know why does the sound what does the vocal sound late you might you can actually make it feel like it's late by Just using the, you know by using the compression in a specific kind of way so yeah, but you can only learn these things by going all the way, by just doing it and going all the way. I have never, I've never been shy of just going for it and experimenting with it. Right. Now, that, that, that brings me to that question I was going to ask. Um, during all your career, I mean, how much experimentation, you know, would you do, especially in the early part of your career? Um, and, and how open should you know, new young engineers be to just experimenting, learning by trial and error? I think this should go all the way, all the way for it. I mean, this should just do it. It's your only chance to do things and, and truly experiment, you know, all the way without being under such pressure mm -hmm. to, to deliver something that's, I don't know, it, it's your opportunity to, because usually as a young engineer if you are mixing something on your own or you're experimenting on your own you are on nobody's clock you are only on your own clock so you should just go for it and try everything imaginable i even wish myself that i had some of those opportunities again you know being like and i still do experiment a lot but mm -hmm. within certain parameters because you are forced to deliver a mix every day and you are forced to do you know as a professional, you are forced to have some sort of a schedule and that truly limits you in some way. And when you are young and you don't have those time limitations, it's your 
amazing opportunity to do whatever the hell you want and experiment to the core of things and go all the way, add distortion to every single track in the mix. You know, really go for it. Try, try to make it sound like very different. Try to make it sound even like if it was like a different kind of record mm -hmm. without being judged, mm -hmm. right? Just for the sake of learning. Mm -hmm. and, and I always say, you know, this is the, when you are young and you are starting your career, that's the right time for you to experiment all the way go all the way with that kind of experimentation. Now, I want to touch on this topic of, of surround, uh, you know, Atmos. This stuff is, is coming in. We see Netflix, you know, basically mandating that, uh, that, that audio now be delivered in this format. We're seeing a lot of entering into the DAWs. We're seeing tools now, uh, surround reverb. Well, one of the companies that have been exhibiting earlier, New Gen has a surround reverb. How do you, how do you transition from, from, a life of mixing in stereo to now mixing in this uh, kind of surround universe? I think that, uh, I'll be honest with you, I think that it's a pretty easy transition. It's a pretty easy trans transition. And we experimented this kind of transition a long time ago with, uh, with surround, right? The early days of surround in the 1990s, and then the development of uh, you know the different formats by Dolby and then uh, T, uh, DTS and 5.1 and then 7.1, 9.2, you name it. it, it kept growing and growing. But even early on, when I started working on those surround albums in the 90s, I thought it was fantastic because you are offered this free card to just do whatever the way, you, whatever the hell you want, because you are not limited by the stereo field. You are not limited by trying to pack all of this information in front of you. In just, you know, obviously there is hive also that you can create with some in a stereo, mm -hmm. but you are very limited in surround. Sometimes you don't even need to to EQ stuff. The kind of stuff that you that you will need to EQ the hell out of in order for it to fit in the stereo field, you don't have to do anymore. You place it here and you hear like full and awesome and full bodied and it's not competing with the vocal. It's not competing with that other guitar. It's not competing with this Hammond. It's not competing with these sound effects. So I think it's a fantastic medium. It's really the kind of emotions that you can create in surround are also, you know, limitless. I mean, you can fantasize as much as you want. The only problem I see with music is when you start using it <coughs> only as a gimmick. When you're not actually creating a full coherent emotion with the song, but you are creating little tricks that happen all around you and distract you from the sun. And that has happened to all of us, you know, during the lear learning process of, you know, how to manage ourselves in the world of surround and now Atmos and all that. Because obviously you can do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> so uh, you, you can be tempted. <laughs> that's a, that, that, brings an, that brings with it an inherent problem. Um, if you could recall... With the first first stereo, sometimes they put. I have some records that they've got the vocal over on the right and the entire yeah. band on the left. So yeah. so they they were experimenting until we came up with a sort of a system that said, okay, no no no, put yeah. the the vocal the the instruments the main instruments down the middle, yeah, and, and then spread <laughs> the ones around that way. So don't put the you know. So so are we now in the early stages of surround still? maybe making those, those kind of uh, mistakes? And has there been a general consensus of where you position things in that kind of uh, three-dimensional space? So like, for example, the vocal, the background vocal is behind here, the percussion is here. I mean, have, has there been any sort of uh, uh, a standard set of, 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 of de facto rules of where you put things? I don't think there are de facto rules yet. I think that we're very close, but we're much more savvy than we were in the 90s mm -hmm. or early 2000s, okay? Mm -hmm. Back then, uh, there have been like 
horrific records being remixed in surround that were like truly horrific. I mean, you love the original song, it groove, you were like, you listen to the surround mix and it was like, what, what is this? You know, you couldn't even lock to the groove, you know, because the main conga that is the, the main beat with the bass, the conga is here and the bass is here and they don't actually, there's no marriage between any of them. And he's like, oh, you don't feel the groove. He's like, what's going on? I don't feel the groove. This song used to be like super groovy. What's going on? So we we did actually commit some of those crimes early on mm -hmm. during the process. So I think that we're much more savvy about it. Mm -hmm. And it, most people that have worked on Surround for some time have listened to some of those failed projects or have actually even done done them themselves right <laughs> so i think that these days we are a tiny bit more careful but still you know it's an open canvas you can do whatever you want so once in a while you know you, there is room for uh, you know for, for gross uh, gross mistakes yeah gross now, mis mistakes yeah now you are um you are uh working in a home studio mm -hmm. and um uh, you you spent you used to work at Ocean where you worked at some of the biggest studios in the world. What is that like making that transition to working from home? How much should you invest in in uh, in a home studio? Should you go all out? Or could you gotta just get it to a stage where you take it somewhere else? Uh, what how how are you thinking about your home studio when you when you created this this wonderful place, which I've actually been yeah. to, and I can attest that it's a wonderful room. Thank you. I'm actually going to explain it by going back how I got here, how I got to this situation where, where I have a home studio. And, and it was a process. And I was an, um, you know, nomadic engineer. I will go from studio to studio every month or every few months. I will be working at one studio for two months, then next studio for four months, another studio for two days, another studio for a week. So that was the story of my life, like everybody else's. And, and I started gathering a few tools that I thought were essential for me to use, like a couple of EQs or a compressor, like very basic amount of things, right? Things that uh, I, I really thought I needed to have, right? So I started saving and investing on some of those. Mm -hmm. That led to having my own setup, a couple of small racks with stuff that I could actually use if I ever had to record even in my own house or in somebody else's garage or in a friend's, you know, rehearsal studio. Mm -hmm. So that led to that. After that, I got my first Pro Tool system. So I had my own recording system plus my recording gear. Next thing you know, I got more preamps. So basically, many years later, I had my first home studio. Not this one, but a smaller home studio. And... I did some of my best work out of that home studio, not because it was technically superior to any other studio I work at, just the opposite. I was far from it, but because I discovered a new freedom in terms of how you clock in a studio, right? Okay, we have 10 hours to do this, or we have 12. That kind of a st a stress that's generated by that aspect of time management can be wonderful for a project or it can be the worst thing in a, in a project. Sometimes this kind of stress can be good. Deadlines are good. Mm -hmm. I really like to have deadlines. I like to have you know, goals every week, every day of what gets done. But to have that level of stress where it affects you creatively, that's... that's that's the aspect that I discovered that you can actually avoid by having your own rig or doing things differently. So I started recording a lot in people's houses, in people's you know, home studios or houses or anywhere, in their backyard. It doesn't matter. And I discovered a new freedom. And that's what actually led me to have my own studio. Now, these days, I like to go out and record in other places because I also like, you know, I still do every every other week but in terms of mixing for example i like to actually mix here in my place most of the time because i have the tools 
but also because I can offer the flexibility to my clients. You know, it's not a deal breaker if somebody comes to me a week after a project has been finished and is adamant about making some changes in one song right before masking. It's not a deal breaker. It's not like, oh, dude, we can't do it. We have to book again, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. whatever studio, you know, have to book again the record plant and mm-hmm. you know, it's going to cost you, you know, 2000 bucks. And then we have to rent this and make sure, you know, that we get all of the gear mm-hmm. just for a little change. You know, these days you can offer that as part of your, and, and you feel more at, at ease, even as a, as a producer, as an engineer, you feel more at ease with the whole process. You know, you, nothing is, nothing becomes a deal breaker. Nothing is like fatal <laughs> for the project right. anymore. Right. Now, Rafa, you successfully made the, the transition to production. You're producing stuff. Yeah, I've been for quite Quite for quite, quite a, a while, time. yeah. So, quite a while. So, is that a different hat that you put on when you're when you're producing? Do you often engineer and produce the same time, or do you sometimes just uh, act as a producer? Uh, How both did that ways. Transition happen. Both both ways, but uh, I usually also engineer at least some of the project when I'm producing. Maybe not everything, but I do end up uh, engineering and I end up mixing very often. Not always, but I end up mixing too. Uh, but to me, it was sort of like an easy transition because I think I became a good engineer when I understood production. I truly became a good engineer when I understood production, when I understood why things, where, where sounds belong, where you know, musical passages belong in the production and how you have to sonically approach that and how you envision it being in the final mix as a final product. So I think that the moment I became a good engineer and a good mixer is when I really became a producer. In my head, I don't mean like commercially speaking, producing for other people, but doing it, of course, but I truly understood what was going through other people's heads. You have to, in a way, read people's heads. When you're producing, you, you, when you're even mixing, just working as a mix engineer, you have to, people need to feel like you're reading their minds in a way. And you have to actually have that approach. You have to have that kind of connection. Mm-hmm. And clients will tell you, damn, right before I could tell you, I mean, you already changed it. You got rid of that guitar. And I was second guessing myself about that guitar. Like, yeah, it's gone. You know, you have to not fear wearing that hat. You have to think as a producer. And I would say, even as a recording engineer. You cannot be a great recording engineer by not thinking about production, not thinking about arrangements, the arrangement of the song, not thinking about the progression of the song. So to me, they go together. Yeah, and and, and uh, you are, you know, like I said, your your passion is 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 like eleven. Um and and you seem to be somebody that could produce any style of music. Um, would you produce any style of music? I have produced every style of music. <laughs> I'm actually producing and, and, classical and, and, and ex- ex- pop. And- explain to me, sir, how is that possible? Because uh, music is message, number one. Mm-hmm. Music, uh, we're transmitting messages. Like right, like Edison will do back in the day, you know, we're transmitting messages, and these messages convey some kind of emotion, right? Being sadness, happiness, it could be anything. You first of all, you need to understand what you are conveying. I think as not even as a producer, even as a as a music maker in general, mm-hmm. even as an arranger, as a music arranger. As a, even as a drummer, you need to understand all of this. All of the great musicians got it. They understand this. And, and after you understand, you know, what you are trying to convey, you gather all of your tools and all of your experiences and put, it, put them at the service of, of, this, of this mission, right? The, your mission is to make this song fucking sad <laughs> right i don't know it could be anything but right. and you go like wow 
what do I know about music making, about arrange, arranging, about musicians, about sounds, about engineering, about everything all together to achieve that? What do I know? Uh, and then it becomes like second nature to you, I guess. It, it's, it's so like, it's just an intuition, an intuition that tells you, no, I got it. This is it. And, and you don't second guess yourself. You're like, no, this is it. I got mm -hmm. it. This is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And it needs to sound like that. It needs to be like that. You have to per perform like this. You have, it's like everything clicks in your head and your heart. And, and hopefully everybody else agrees with you. <laughs> That's the other part about, you know, producing, you know, you have to actually sell your ideas mm -hmm. to your audience. Your audience is the artist. Your audience is the record label. Your audience is the manager, right? You have to sell it to them. And your audience is also the musicians that you are using to achieve this, you know, uh, this final result. But you have to actually sell it to all of them. They have to understood, understand that you got it, that it, it is what you are imagining and it, they, they need to be helpful you know, during the process and help you achieve it. So I think that it is very intuitive. I think that intuition is your biggest asset. But in order to have intuition, you have to experiment a lot. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned earlier, I think that one of the most important aspects about honing your intuition is early experimentation, not being afraid about experimenting, about making mistakes, big mistakes, not the small mistakes. I'm talking about the big ones, mm -hmm. making like the really big mistakes, mm -hmm. the awful mistakes. They were like, oh shit, you know, like this really didn't work. This really sucks. You need to be brave enough to confront those type of mistakes and you have to, to make them. There's no way of, there's no way of, learning to be exceptional always playing in the safe zone there's no way i mean i don't see how that could actually happen i don't know anybody who has played safe and is making exceptional music they're usually risk risk takers they actually don't give a damn they go like no this is what's going to happen let's do it and they take risk and they achieve exceptional things so that has been my model it, you know, and but I, also I was very very lucky. I worked with very with lots of exceptional people, so I had a chance to learn from a lot of those exceptional people. I had a chance to learn about not just how they did things, but their personalities, why they were doing it, and why why were they so blunt about things like not afraid. Not afraid. Maybe they were afraid, but they didn't look afraid, right? Right. What, what was going through their head? So I learned a little bit about that. What, you know, knowing people, you know, asking questions. It, it is very important to ask questions. How are you going to learn by just observing? Sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes you need to inquire about the inner reason why they're doing it that way. You need to ask bluntly, what were you thinking mm -hmm. when you decided to change the arrangement like that and do it like this and force the singer to sing like that and do it? And yeah, and that's part of the learning process. Wow, man. Listen, it's so inspiring talking to you, man. It, it is. It is. I mean, I, I get I get pumped up. I like I, I just want to go home now and make some music. <laughs> like you just get me, you 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 get me so inspired. Now you have won how many Grammys? What's the number? Seventeen. Seventeen. 17. Now, what's it like to win one Grammy? No, actually, that's the most emotional uh, one. The one that you go like the first one, right? Is the one that you go like, oh shit, you know, this could happen to me. Because up to that point, it's always just, it's so far, you know, you see like such a far ambition, right? And, and actually, it is also very important to not do it for that reason, in a way. And the more you don't do it for that reason, the closer you're going to be to that opportunity of getting one. Right. I really believe in that. Because you have to be blunt about music creation. You cannot just 
do what everybody else is doing. You observe other people and you learn from other people, but you have to create your own thing. You have to create your own style of things. And you, everybody listens differently. Everybody hears differently. For example, if I'm in the same room with five different people, everybody's going to perceive things slightly different. So if I put the faders up for a mix, even with subgroups, one with the drums, the bass, the guitars, the keyboards, and the vocals, and I have five different people rebalance those, it's going to sound like five different, completely different mixes, just with balance. Mm -hmm. So that tells you how differently we think or we hear, we think, and then we react to it. It's like this, this, and this, right? Mm -hmm. Your heart. Mm -hmm. How the three things work together? Wow. Depend it's up to your own personality. It's just you. You only, you are the only one who can hear that way, react that way, and do things that way. And hopefully other people like it, right? Hopefully other people not just agree with you, but they love it and they want to only work with you. So that's how you, yeah, start, you know, developing your thing and creating your own thing. But yeah, we, we all we don't feel that differently in terms of the overall feeling of how we perceive things and how they affect us, but we connect things differently. We connect your hearing with, with our brain and with our reactions very, very differently. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the Grammys, okay? This Grammy thing. You won one Grammy, the first one. Uh -huh. What is the feeling when you won the 10th one? Is it the same? Yeah. No, it's it's a great feeling. It's a it's a feeling of it corroborates that you are up to something. You are still up right. to something, right? That you right. are still, you know. And believe me, eh, in the Grammys, I've been a big, big, big loser. I've been nominated over I don't know how many times. It's ridiculous, like mm -hmm. almost seventy times, a lot. It, yeah. a lot of times. So it just being there every year and being recognized by your peers. Do you know that they like what you're doing or? what you created with a specific project maybe they like the engineer or they like for example this year do you know in the latin grammys i'm up for a, a tango tango project i never been nominated for a tango project before and i love it i love that i work on a tango project and it's in the top five out of every tango album that came out right man in this year so but it's all about I don't know. You have to project what you are imagining and, okay, you work on something and you want to make it special even for yourself, no, even not for other people, for yourself. You want to make it, ah, you have, want to give it all, make it like super special, you know, be like very emotional and you can help it. You just go all the way and you just do it. So when you, you receive your 10th Grammy, I think that you will still feel like, you know, reassured in a way, okay, I'm, uh, you know, my feelings are right about things, right? I, I got, I still got something you're, to you're say. You're on the right track. <laughs> yeah, you're on the right track. <laughs> okay, so 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 you know it's amazing, and I, and I, and I'm looking right out at the audience right now, and just to say, um, here's a man uh, that you know is, is from Spain, living in America, uh, with 17 Grammy awards that is still willing to come and share his feelings about music and his feeling about the industry with us. And he's doing it for just because we asked him to. I mean, there's no money changing hands here or anything. It's just he is committed to sharing this experience uh, and sharing his love uh, with us tonight. So, you know, I want everybody to really appreciate that this is rare. And we also don't take it for granted. So, you know, and, and I, I've taken a bit of your time, Rafa, so I'm going to kind of wind it up here. Um, I want to say on behalf of all the people that are out there that are aspiring, uh, you are an inspiration. I could speak personally for myself. Um, I, like, I'm, like, I can't wait to get out of here. I think I'm going to do some music tonight because <laughs> you, you've, got, you've got me really, 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 really do. And and I, you know, you can feel the passion. And I, I think the people that work with you also could feel this passion. And 
And my my only the only thing I could I could I could wonder, I mean, is there a substitute for this passion? I don't know. I don't think so. You also need to find all the things that you love. You know, I love, I mean, there are things that I love. You know, I love music, I love uh, wine, I love winemaking, you know, I'm in that business, getting mm-hmm. into that business. I love things that, you know, convey emotion, convey mm-hmm. a message. We're mm-hmm. talking about that, conveying a message, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing, you know, with wine, same thing. You can actually transmit the same kind of emotions through, through tra- taste, the smell, other things. So, I think that you can find in life many things that allow you to express yourself. It's it's about expressing yourself and expressing it in a way that you consider it to be meaningful to to yourself, you know, that have some kind of meaning to you. Like like today, after this, I'm actually going to go back to making music. I'm actually... (laughs) You and me both. (laughs) Yes, it's, you know, it, it is truly our passion, but, you know, but I'm also very, very grateful about being given the chance of doing these kind of things because I wish early on in my career that I, this kind of you know channels of information would have been available. Back then, it was just a couple of magazines. That was it. Period. There wasn't anything else. If you wanted to ask anybody a question, you had to you had to write a letter. Okay. Let's forget about email. It didn't it didn't exist. You had to write a letter to some, which I did back in the day. I was still living in Europe and I wrote letters to US producers, engineers, you name it. I was fearless. I was just like, what can happen? They are probably never going to answer, but a couple of them actually, couple, a couple of them answer. So I think this is a great opportunity, you know, to, you know, to, to explain a, a little bit about, you know, other people's experiences and how, how they have done it and how it, how it still works for them. So I still get excited about music every day. And that's I, the I, I could tell, man. I think everybody here could tell. And, and, and we love you for it, man. And, and I just want to thank you. It's, uh, it's getting late. We've had you on here. We thought it was going to be half an hour, but it's, oh, it's an hour and 15 minutes. So uh, thank you. God bless you. God continue to, to, to grant you all of this incredible opportunity. Uh, I'm looking forward to the 18th Grammy. I'm looking forward to seeing you next time I come out to the Grammys. Uh, you've always been there. A uh, good friend of IMSTA, a good friend of myself. And, and uh, we just ho- help, hope we can help you in some little way uh, uh, to make up for this amazing amount of information you've given us, not just tonight, but on the, uh, the interviews that we've got that we're going to broadcast later. So I just wanted to, anything, any last minute words that you want to say to all the guys out there, uh, all the people aspiring to do what you've done, what do you say to them, Rafa? I think that you have to be fearless in life. You have to be blunt about what you have to say. And, and you have to just do it. Have the, find the energy to do it and never be afraid. Afraid is the biggest creativity killer out there. It's like a freaking monster that eats you alive. And I think that the key is to not be afraid, not be afraid, ever be afraid, you know, once in a while it's going to hit you, but not be afraid, be blunt, be, you know, it's a journey. It takes a long time. If you are in it for the love of music, it's a long journey. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you are also going to enjoy it for a very, very long time, which is very rewarding. So yeah, that's what I would say. And I would say, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It has been great to be here. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. And uh, go off and make some great music. Um, (laughs) And I look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Thank you, Rafa. See you soon. You are absolutely the best. Absolutely the best. Thank Thank you. you so much.